I, get I just uh, was just wanting you to maybe branch out, do whatever you want to do, because I think you have <laughs> don't don't so much focus on us, focus on you and your creative experience. Hey, Tim, how's it going? You're back to Montana, I see. Yes, back to the snow country. Oh, <laughs> it's going all week here. <laughs> Oh my God. Oh, Craig, try doing that meditation I set and then repeat what you just said. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Well, well, you know, I did do this. Um, you know, I have this uh, analyst uh, from Zurich who's mm. the young uh, uh, director of programs at the Young Institute. And, you know, and I kept telling her about all these problems I was having with the body and, you know, with dreams of emaciated dogs and, things like that. And she says, uh, she says, well, you need um, to take care of your little earth. You know, uh, she, she told me that I should have uh, cranial sacral uh, therapy, you know. Right, right. You, and yeah. you've had that now. You have yes. to tell us about and it. Was, it was wonderful. It really was. Because, I, you know, I, it, all they do is just touch an area and just hold their hands there for a long time. They start with the, with the abdomen, almost like the chakras. Then they move up to the upper abdomen. And she says, do you, do you feel anything? And I said, not really. I, I think my body is ice and it needs to thaw out. And then when she got to the heart, that was the first time I did feel something happening. And what I was feeling was the head melting, not the body. Yeah. It was yeah. the head that needed melting, not the body. And then suddenly there was a connection uh, between um, a better. Uh, see, because before that, I, I just felt this real intense little ball of light in the top of my head, you know, and it was very tense. And even though I was thinking that I was meditating, I wasn't because after that, melted it um was totally different hi miles well, that's fascinating yeah and then so, she did like, so they're not meditation. they're not actually manipulating they're actually just, it's it's just just the touch touching and then she i'm t miles i'm talking about cranial sacral therapy which this analyst said i needed to do because i was so disconnected from rootedness in the body and sensation and feeling you know and then she comes up and she puts one finger in the ear like this. And she puts another finger and then she puts one in both. And then she puts her hands on her head. Then she started at the feet. And I think that was so magical when she touched the soles of your feet, you know. And, uh, but the real best part of it was uh, when she, um, went back up the body and this time she put this hole on the abdomen she formed an opening on the top of the abdomen and i you know i had uh, thought out my brain hi jan i'm just talking about this cranial sacral therapy i had <laughs> and then i was as if i you know i was kept trying to put my awareness where she was touching trying to have my consciousness there you know like you know, I have a feeling in my gut, I have a feeling in my heart, you know, some, some thinking of the heart of the goal. But anyway, she, when I, when she did that, that I felt if I was standing in uh, like a, a, a round crater looking up and everything was singing because the God of all our cells is food you know, nutrition, and that's what they, that's who they worship, you know, but that's anyway, amazing. yeah, I'm going to do another one uh, for very soon. You know, so, it sounds a lot like, uh, like Reiki, even, even the experiences, you know, so now I'm going to have to look it up and compare what they, what they're doing. Yeah. Well, uh, hi, Jan and Mary, and uh, uh, yeah, Gary, I mean, I would like to hear more about your experiences too, and of course, uh, Tim maybe can tell us about his, how would, how'd it go in California, Tim? Oh, it was great. Um, I got a lot of painting done and, and actually generated a bunch of very unexpected business. So oh, I'm actually great. going back next month for another show. Exciting. What part of California? 
Well, I was in Carmel. If you've ever been oh, there, yeah. it is just a magical village. Yeah, is that near like Big Sur? Or... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's where Robinson Jeffers lived, actually. Right. In fact, did my... you see his tower? Yeah, his my family home is about two blocks from his tower. So you knew all about him. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I took a picture. That's how of you for come. You. You're so smart about him. <laughs> yeah, is it's uh, it's snow there, and I suppose it's still snow with miles. But anyway, well, we'll get started here because this is really uh, uh, you, you know where we left off was the was the well, which um, uh, you know that the little prince can automatically find the water of life because he is the water of life. So even in the desert, he finds the water of life. You know, and. Uh, and what is the water of life? The self and the and the divine child and the little prince are all the source of renewal. Okay, the source of renewed life. Hi, Carlos. Just started, and so the source of renewal then brings up, um, you know, what von Franz uh, was asking: What does it represent? And that's what everyone told her: there was a source of renewal. But then she says, well, what is the practical link in our everyday life to, uh, uh, to um, this renewal, this renewal? And of course, it's the inferior function, you know, that part of us that is the night, since the divine child, the source of renewal. And we're going to find out later how, how um, when you talk about creativity, when you talk about um, uh, the, the experience of the self, how it always has to be something that's never seen before. If it's the same thing you saw before, you're sort of reiterating, regurgitating something because whenever the self comes, it's always some brand new thing that's never been seen, you know? So uh, anyway, uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about the, the uh, idea of playfulness, which is the idea of uh, the playfulness is what brings the water of life, the inferior function, the practical link between ego and the water of life is, and the source of renewal is playfulness. And that happens in the inferior function. Okay. So um, the main thing in getting to play playfulness is to scratch away our pseudo ad adaptations which with, with which we cover the, um, the inferior function, which would be, su you know, if you're a feeling person, it would be pseudo thinking, okay? So if you're a feeling type and you think uh, you're, you're thinking, hi, Arpane, just starting, we're talking about the inferior function, the playfulness, the water of life, what's the connection? How do we connect? with that, the source of renewal, which the little prince in his positive adult uh, form would represent. And yet he's this, this mixed symbol. He's not a pure symbol. So uh, the, the whole idea is, um, we'll find out later. Of course, uh, the tragic end says that there was a, a, a misfire, you know, but anyway, we're talking about the inferior function and how do we uh, contact the source of renewal, the water of life. And uh, she says, well, it's definitely not through the pseudo adaptations that we have with the feeling function. So, uh, I mean, with the inferior function. So if the feeling type thinks their thinking is their, what they learned at school, they're wrong, completely wrong. And the thinking person, if he thinks it's just his, his uh, I loved you, I hate you, you know, or she says, you know, you know that's not the feeling function for the, um, for the thinking person. And then for the intuitive person, uh, you know, the sensation function, that's me, you know, and one of the things she says that for the, uh, since for that, that person tends to not to dress very basically, eat very basically, you know, if the, that's their pseudo adaptation to uh, the uh, sensate function. 
And, you know, like my wife says, well, that's whenever I leave, all you ever do is eat hamburger and egg whites day after day. <laughs> and so that's pretty basic. But they say, if you seriously get in touch, like an intuitive gets in touch with the sensate function, they really have established a connection with their inferior function. Then intuition uh, informs it, you know, and they will, uh, they will never wear store-bought clothes again. They will never eat hotel food again. Everything has to be, have this level of uh, the new renewal, the state of renewal of sensate, the sensate function. You know, so uh, well, that's that's the idea behind um, now the. Um, so what we were kind of saying is that uh, this idea of that that the inferior function for you cannot be this your pseudo adaptation for it, because that's a re, that's a relationship to the utilitarian world. You know, if you're a feeling function person and you're going to school. You just need to memorize everything because you can't think very well. And if you're a thinking person and you're going to a funeral, just do basic condolences. You know, don't go in there and fake uh, your uh, relatedness. So um, because the, um, the, the, the idea here is that um, you cannot... Uh, enter the world of renewal or enter the world of play in the utilitarian world with this with the inferior function the inferior function that is our source of renewal always has to deal with that which is completely non-useful in the outer world okay so uh, that's what play is you know Play is going to be something that's related to uh, to the absolute. Um, uh, no, nobody can develop the inferior function uh, before having first created a temenos. She says, uh, you know, you have to um, because uh, our inferior function is so inefficient. If we try to act in the outer world through it, it's like trying to write. If you're right-handed, trying to write with your left hand. Or if you're left-handed, trying to write with your right hand, it's a very inefficient way of adapting to the to the world. But um, uh, if in it, and it take it's a very inefficient way of adapting to the internal world. But if you use it only for the sense of play, then it starts to work, you know. And it, so she says it has to be given whole Sundays, whole afternoons, and nothing might come out of it except that you're bringing the inferior function to life. But that is the whole point, you know, is uh, you don't use it for, ex if you're a feeling function, you don't use thinking for examinations or study, uh, but you um, have to think about something that interests you in, your, in, in itself. So like she says, uh, for the feeling function person to think about their dream images, you know, that's the best place for a feeling function person to think, is to think about their dream images, uh, because those are not useful in the outer world. And that will give them that sense of, of, of the, you cannot do it any, the essence of play is that has to be, there has to be no meaning in play. It cannot be useful, you know, uh, that they must, it has to be uh, something that is um, really just that, that, that it's the door to the unconscious. So it's the door to the inner world. So it has to deal with the inner world, not the outer world. So that's why it needs to be done, not, you know, uh, in an office or at a workplace. It needs to be done in the sacred grove, the hidden place. You know, the, and the, the first thing is to find uh, this uh, sacred grove. Then you have gotten rid of, and getting rid of all the onlookers, then you can begin. And as a child, you need a place and a time where there's no interference 
with an adult audience or the outer world. So anyway, that's the source of renewal. That's the water of life. That's where we find it. And the divine child and the self in, in us is um, represented by the um, inferior function. It's the water of life, the center source of renewal, because the divine child is that naive thing. Okay. Again, in the fairy tales, who cannot lift the curse? It's the dominant functions. The sons of King Ego will never do it because they're so efficient. They go follow the straight road. They go the direct way to solve the problem and they fail all the time. The only one who can solve it is the one who's rejected by the conscious attitude, by the king, the one who they, the fool on the hill, you know, uh, and the one who is, uh, his only helpers are not uh, scholars and professors and scientists. His helpers are animal helpers. The source of renewal, the water of life, the divine child. Okay, well, anyway, it's, uh, so then uh, that's, the, that's the idea of the water of life, which is, is really interesting. And I just love that uh, little poem that he wrote about water, uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, oh, water, thou hast no color and no taste. Thou canst not be, uh, be defined. One tastest thee without knowing thee. Thou dost penetrate us with the joy which cannot be explained by the senses, the water of life. Through thy blessing, all the dried up sources of our heart begin to flow afresh. It thaws out. Yeah. Thou art the greatest treasure on earth. Thou dost not suffer any mixture or brook any alteration. Thou art a dark divinity, but thou dost impart an infinitely simple joy. Now that's a little poem to the water of life and to the inferior function and to the sense of renewal. Okay, so anyway, um, we'll move on now, <laughs> unless anybody has any questions to uh, return to our book. Um, did I say hi to everybody, Carlos? and uh, Oh, Jordy. Yeah, I think Jordy came in. Hi, Jordy. Okay, now to return to our book after this uh, climax of happiness of the water of life where they found the well, then the tragic end follows relatively quickly. Uh, little, the little prince asks Exupery to draw him a muzzle for the sheep in order that they might, may not eat the rose on the planet. And by this, Exupery guesses the little prince does intend to leave the earth. So Exupery, uh, is though continues to work on the repair of his engine and has accomplished it on just the evening when he hears the little a prince uh, rearranging a nocturnal rendezvous with somebody. So the uh, exupery is going to return to the ordinary world and the little prince is going to return to the beyond. They made the decision at the same time. So there's this act of they're going to be cut apart, you know, but it happens at the same time for some reason. So anyway, he hears him talking to someone and he rushes to uh, find out who he's talking to. And besides the well, beside the well, there was a ruin of an old stone wall and he sees uh, um, the little prince sitting on it, dangling his feet, speaking to someone. And uh, uh, he, he can't hear what the other party is saying, but um, they're making some plans. And he continued his walk uh, towards the wall, but didn't see or hear anyone. But the little uh, prince uh, replies once again, you will see where my track begins in the sand. You have nothing to do but wait for me there, and I shall be there tonight. And the next super is just uh, 60 feet away from the wall, still sees nothing. And then after a silence, the little prince speaks again. You have good poison. Are you sure that it will not make me suffer too long? And then Ixupri stops in his track, his heart torn asunder, but still doesn't understand. And then the little prince says, well, now move away. 
I'm going to come down from the wall. And he dropped his eyes. And then at the foot of the wall, he, his heart leaped in the air because be facing the little prince was one of those little yellow snakes in the desert that take 30 seconds to bring your life to an end. And even as he was digging for his revolver in his pocket, to, uh, uh, he made a running step back. But at the noise, the snake let himself float easily across the sand like the dying spray of a fountain and in no apparent hurry disappeared with a light metallic sound among the stones. And he reaches the wall just in time to catch his little prince in his arms, his face as white as snow. What does this mean? Exupery asked. Why are you talking with snakes? And he loosened the golden mu muffler he always wore moistened his temples and gave him some water to drink but he didn't dare ask him any more questions he he looked at me gravely and put his arms around my neck and i felt his heart beating like the heart of a dying bird shot with someone's rifle i'm glad you have found what was the matter with your engine he said now you can go back home well how did he know that again it's because exupery had not told him anything, but Exupery and the little prince are the same. You know, this is the inner uh, self and or the childish infantile shadow mixture of both. Could be either, depending on Exupery's reaction to it. Exupery is the one who is going to make it either the divine child or the infantile shadow, you know. So, uh, but he knows everything. He knew that the picture of the hat was a snake that swallowed an elephant. You know, no one else did. And that was because uh, he's this omniscient self within him. So um, uh, he says, uh, um, he asks him, um, how did you know that? I mean, I was just coming to tell you uh, about that that my work has been successful beyond anything I dared to hope, fixing his airplane engine. And uh, the little prince made no answer to my question, but added, I too am going back home today. Then sadly, but it's much farther, it's much more difficult. And I realized that something extraordinary was hap happening. I was holding him close in my arms as if he were a little child. And yet it seemed to me that he was rushing headlong towards the abyss from which I could do nothing to restrain him. His look was very serious, like someone lost far away. And uh, he tells him, oh, I have drawn your sheep and I have the sheep's box and I've drawn the sheep's muzzle. And he just gave me a sad smile. And then I waited a long time. I could see he was reviving little by little. And he... Uh, says, dear little man, you are, you're afraid. He was afraid, but there was no doubt about that. But he laughed lightly. I shall be much more afraid this evening. Once again, I felt myself frozen by the sense of something irreparable. Uh, and the little prince trembles when Exupery rushed towards him and, and scolds him. But Exupery feels he cannot hold him back, that it is too late and nothing will help him. And uh, uh, this experience of helplessness, of not being able to, to save someone from death, was impressed on Exupery through the death of his, his little brother, Francois, who died when he was 15, and ASC, or Exupery was 17. So now, no doubt he experienced the death of his brother very consciously. And that experience shocked him deeply. And it was always in all of his novels, he wrote a, a lot of books. Whenever he described someone's death, there was this terrific feeling of helplessness. One stands there with the feeling that the person is slowly slipping away, floating away from you, and you're utterly helpless and can't do anything. You know, you can't hold them back. And here's was his same experience for he realized the little prince has arranged a meeting with the snake, with death, in order to be killed by the sand viper, but he feels he can't do anything. The little prince tries to comfort him, 
but instead of being comforted, uh, uh, but in, instead of being comforted by a uh, exupery, and he says, all men have the stars, but they are not the same things for all people. For some who are travelers, the stars are guides. For others, they are no more than lights in the sky. For others who are scholars, they are big problems. But for my businessmen, they were wealth. But all the stars are silent. You, you alone will have the stars as no one else has ever had them. And what are you trying to say? In one of those stars, I shall be living. In one of them, I shall be laughing. His, his inner self, his psychological inner self. And so it will be as if all the stars were laughing when you look at the sky at night. You, only you will have stars that can laugh. And he laughed again. It will be as if in place of the stars, I'd given you a great number of bells that knew how to laugh. And he laughed again. Then he quickly became serious. Tonight, you know, don't come. I shall not leave you, I said. But I shall look as if I were suffering. I shall look as if I were dying. It is like that. Don't come to see that. It's not worth the trouble. I shall not leave you. But he was worried. I'm telling you, it's because of the snake. He must not bite you, you know, exupery. Snakes, they're malicious creatures. This one might bite you just for fun. Exupery says, I shall not leave you. But then the, the the little prince says, but it is true that they have no more poison for the second bite. So Exubery promises not to leave the little prince. He's, he uh, misses going with him. And then that night I did not see him set out on his way. He got away from me without making a sound. When I succeeded in catching up with him, he was walking along with a quick and resolute step. And he said to me merely, ah, you are there. And he took me by the hand, but he was still worrying. It was wrong of you to come. You will suffer. I shall look as if I were dead. And that will not be true. And I said nothing. You understand, it is too far. I cannot carry this body with me. Back to the star, he's saying. It's too heavy. And still, Exupri said nothing. But... My body will look like an abandoned shell, but there's nothing sad about shells. I said nothing. He was a little discouraged, but he made one more effort. You know, it will be very nice. I too shall look at the stars and all the stars will be wells of the water of life. All the stars will pour out fresh water for me to drink. I said nothing. That will be amusing. You will have 500 million little bells. I will have 500 million springs of fresh water. And uh, he too said nothing because here he was crying. You know, one time Von Franz uh, used to help Young dig out, he had a spring at Bollingen and she, he would like to dig out a trench that went to Lake Zurich because he liked to hear the gurgling of the water as it ran through the trench. And so there, digging uh, there to, for that. And as they're digging, uh, Young told her, this is what I spent my whole life doing, digging out springs, you know, digging out this water of life, you know, the source of renewal, you know. Um, but uh, so um, he sat down because he was afraid. He says, you know, my flower, is anima. I am responsible for her, and she's so weak. She's so naive. She has four thorns of no use at all to protect herself against the world. And uh, I was, I, I too sat down because I couldn't stand it any, any longer. And then the little prince says, well, that's all. He's, he still hesitated a little. Then he got up, took one step, and Exupery could not move. 
Exupery sat down and then uh, the little prince, uh, well, he came to the decisive, she's repeating this, the decisive sentence. I could not move. Exupery cannot do a thing. He remained sitting. There was nothing but a flash of yellow close to his ankle. He remained motionless for an instant. He did not cry out. He fell as, as gently as a tree falls, but there was no sound because of the sand. And after a while, uh, Exupery remembers with horror that he'd forgotten to draw the uh, strap for the sheep's muzzle. But then there's this last picture, and the last picture, I didn't get it up here, but it was the uh, one of the uh, of the uh, of the um, just the uh, it's a desert with one star in it. Let's see if I can get it real quick here. Yeah, here it is. It's pretty basic. Actually, it didn't have any. Um, uh, uh, color even in the uh, uh, in the book Let's see if I can find it. This is, there we go okay so this is this is the photo or the uh, drawing okay and uh, um, exupery says uh, under this picture this is to me the loveliest and saddest landscape in the world it is here that the little prince appeared on earth and disappeared. Look at it carefully so that you will be sure to recognize it in case you travel someday to the African desert. And if you should come up on this spot, please do not hurry on. Wait for a time exactly under that star. Then if a little man appears who laughs, who has golden hair, and refuses to answer questions, you will know who he is. And if this should happen, please comfort me. Send me word that he has come back. Now he's kind of talking also about Francois. But they're kind of mixed. I mean, the inner and the outer are a little bit mixed there. So, uh, you know, von Franz says this is just a full of symbolism. And she's going to go through the symbols. The little prince has to be killed like a human being in order to return his, to his star. His body would be too heavy otherwise. But this is a very strange uh, image because the little prince is an inner figure. He's a symbol of the self within ex opere. He would not need his body to return to the star. He is in the psychological realm, realm and could return whenever he wanted, either to the earth or back to the star again. So where is the star and where is earth? He came down holding onto a flock of birds. So at the time, he had a certain amount of body. He could not uh, fly through the air or fall down to the earth. He needed the help of birds. And it was strange this idea didn't occur to him again instead of, of, you know, having the snake poison him. So now the little prince seems to consist of psyche and body. He didn't before. Now he does. That's the idea that when he was on the star, he was just psyche. And once, once he comes to earth, now he is psyche and body. So the self or the little prince is now entered the human realm and is, has incarnated in the human realm to some extent, which it didn't before. So it is no longer just a content of the unconscious, which remains in the psyche, in the unconscious. It's already incarnated in the human realm and has become physically real because he's, he's both part of Exupery and Exupery is part of him. They, uh, you know, they met, we're gonna uh, hear about this. Uh, make sure I don't uh, go too long here. Okay, um, so the little prince, uh, it sh this um, shows in a nutshell that the symbol of the little prince is a mixture of childish shadow and the self this impure symbol 
The little prince is an impure symbol, partly the childish infantile shadow of exupery of the Poer Eternus. Partly he's the Poer Eternus, this uh, in the mother realm, can't escape, which is already incarnated in the symbol of the self, uh, which is not incarnate. The self is not incarnated in the, in the shadow. As a symbol of the self, it is in the beyond and is eternal where there is no such thing as death. Now, she's going to make a really, some very important statements about the self here, which are going to um, be something I never heard before. It's, it's very amp, very, um, uh, you know, informing. The self does not, um, the self uh, is eternal where there is no such thing as death. All the self does, has is an appearing and a disappearing. An appearing in the human realm and a disappearing out of the human realm. So it appears and it disappears. So the experience, uh, this is just as an experience of the self comes to us, then we lose it again. So if we look at it from the point of view of the self, it means that sometimes it touches the realm of our human consciousness, but then it disappears. You know, this is, this is the nature of the self. We're going to find out why it is like this. Why, why is its nature of this sort? In a second. But in so far as it has a body, it is incarnated in us and in our realm. And that means... If it has incarnated us, it's become audible and visible through our own actions. It has become part of ourselves. So then the problem is difficult. Now, is it going to be the shadow or is it going to be the incarnated self? The snake kills the shadow. The snake can only poison the wrong body in us, which would be the one that is whose inner figure is the shadow. That's the one the snake can kill. You know, it can't kill the one that's incarnated by the self. So the snake can only poison the shadow body. And then it frees the symbol after it's killed the shadow. Freed the symbol of the self uh, from the wrong body it got into. So the, uh, and, and the, so the other possibility would be that the incarnation of the self after the shadow and in exupery had been killed would have gone on. Then the symbol of the little prince would have evolved on a more adult and different level. But it's in this in-between state between shadow and self. You don't know which. So, and the development is interrupted by the poison of the snake. Um, I don't know whether you, well, if you have any questions, just ask them, but it's, uh, I don't know if we're getting it, but I think if we go on a little bit more, it will, it will become a little clearer. I'd um, just like to draw attention to, to uh, the caduceus, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's used by pharmacies. It's often by, used by a pharmacy. And does, is, that not, is that two snakes going up a sword or something? Mm -hmm. And I suppose what it's conveying is that the pharmacist is using essentially snake venom to kill something that's a shadow medically within a person. Um, and so at once it's both beneficial, but also potentially poisonous. The, the, the poison can be its own antidote. The only person who can heal is the one who's been wounded because the wound awakens the healing function within us, you know. So you cannot heal another one, another person, unless you've been wounded yourself. And this, this is what uh, Jung says about someone who has suffered a incredibly grievous wound. And he says, like Asclepius, 
the only, let's say, let, I'm just gonna give you an example, that your child has been taken away from you somehow. It's an un, and it's a wound that will not heal, okay? Jung says the only way that you can heal it is to be in service to others who've suffered a similar wound, okay? That is the healing function. So that's when in AA, when they say one sober drunk needs another sober drunk, like a man lost at sea needs a lifeboat. Because the only way the wounded alcoholic can cure his alcoholism is being in service to other uh, people who've been wounded by addiction. That's, I think, is the wisdom, the great wisdom behind, behind the sponsor-sponsee relationship. I think you'll find in, in the 12 steps, and I'm not pushing it, but there is a wisdom there that is, is very ancient, okay? You know, as, you know, the sacred circle. Where do you see the sacred circle anymore? You don't see it anywhere. In AA, every person speaks. Just like they would do in, in, in a uh, uh, Native American ceremony, you know, uh, everyone. And then, you know, you listen to all these supposedly disembodied comments of, in the circle. And when it gets all the way to around, they seem like they're one piece. You know, it's like our town. But anyway, the idea is, is exactly what you said, Miles, that the poison is its own antidote. The wound is, awakens the healing function. Finish. Of course, the snake also represents, um, uh, let's just say, uh, snake wisdom means that you need to bow down close to the earth and listen to its voice. I mean, Gary had a dream that said that the other night. Told him that he needed to uh, to uh, be like the snake and be close to the earth. That's what his dream said. You know, it's just a beautiful image. But anyway, uh, they. Uh, so now we're going to go on uh, to the uh, the idea of the. Um, let's see. Let me see. Um, so uh, the symbol of the self was only, now he's going to give a really interesting thing here about the symbol of the self was only meant to meet him at this critical moment and then it can return to the place it came from. So that would be the positive aspect of this tragic moment. But at the same time, one somehow feels this is negative insofar as exupery in his own life did not return to his adaptation to the world. And she's gonna go on about this too, about the about the, the systole and diastole, you know, that we need to come in and we need to embrace the world and we need to come in and we need to embrace the world. For the, for the little prince to return to his rose and forget his earth friend, the fox, that was the fatal error. He has an earth friend and a, uh, so he needs systole and diastole. He needs to alternate between these two worlds. So this, this aspect of choosing one over the other and not having this tension anymore is fatal, you know. Uh, and she, she's going to go a little more clarify this for us. Um, the, the, um, so we can say that the departure uh, insofar as, as exupery in his own life did not return to his adaptation to the world, but soon after followed the little prince to his star. You know, he went down over uh, 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 just south of France in his, uh, his uh, plane, you know, and uh, uh, so he, he, and he did it almost seemingly on purpose. So um, he did not... Uh, he, so we can say that, that Exupery's departure from the desert after his plane fixed never really happened. 
he never went back to his adaptation in the real world. I don't really know what the timeline of the little prince and his death were. I think he died in 44. I'm not sure what date the little prince was written, but it, anyway, it wasn't carried through. They weren't cut apart, you know. Uh, so as, as, as the little prince forgets his fox friend, so does Ixupari. You know, Ixupari forgets his, his earth. So the human part of Exupery follows the little prince and thus the departure of the little prince became an anticipation of Exupery's death. So uh, with this comes the fact that Exupery had not accepted the departure. Remember this book is called The Poor Returns, but we're gonna hear some more general parts uh, that will apply to all of us. With this comes the fact that Exupery had not accepted the departure and, and as we see. Uh, because he says, then if a little man appears who laughs and has golden hair, refuses to answer questions, you know, um, send me word that he has come back. So Exupery has not given up uh, this, this uh, Peter Pan, never, never laugh, the little prince, you know, he's going to, he wants to stay there. You know, it's it, so, so he cannot accept the departure of this, uh, though it is quite unlikely the little prince will ever return. So he has not sacrificed the relationship. It's another fatal hint, hint, because if one does not sacrifice such an experience after having had it, there remains a constant pull towards death and the unconscious. You have to return to the fox in the can I just yeah. ask one question? Yes, here? go ahead, Anna. Um, does the little prince actually ever realize the danger he is in? Do you think that? Um, well, and now, von Franz, no, I don't think he did exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, because he had, and, and I think it was because of his, the feminine in him was his unbelievably domineering mother, the old devouring witch the snake that swallows his genius, which is mm -hmm. the elephant. The fact yeah. that the, his earth uh, could, couldn't hold his genius, the body, his psychic substance, he had none. It was yeah. not enough to hold 18 elephants. And if you mm -hmm. saw, they were the four functions, you know, uh, the way they were arranged. Yeah. And then his girlfriend introduces him to opium. So she's the young witch, the witch of addiction. So, wow. so what, what he's missed, I mean, his, between his mother and his girlfriend is the, the great mother of nature, Sophia, yeah. and the transforming anima, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and she, von Franz thought that this book was so symbolic that if he, he could have had Jungian analysis, he was certainly capable. But she says what she has found with Pueri Turnuses is they understand everything. You tell them yeah. all of these concepts, they know all about it. And yet they mm -hmm. still, uh, you know, uh, die Not young. Yeah. No, they can't. He could not move. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what, that's what she says are the decisive words of the whole book. Mm -hmm. He could not know. So you could, he knew all of, I think, like you said, was he aware of this? I think he was to some extent aware of what the problem was, but he could not know. So this is, mm -hmm. this is uh, an aspect of the where that um, is, it comes up. Some can't leave, you know, some just can't leave. And now, one who who um, who did leave was uh, Goethe. You know, Goethe was a yeah. Goethe was a Poeri Turnus, and mm -hmm. and he he did it by making uh, bringing all of uh, realizing that mm -hmm. his wisdom was the fox and the. Mm -hmm. He needed to take all this poor stuff back as an offering to the fox and to the earth. And that was how he cured himself, you know. Yes. Now she's going to mention here too, uh, and Miles brought it up about 
um, what is the antidote to the poison for the polarians? You know, the wounded, whoever has a wound, how do they heal themselves? And uh, she does it very compellingly here, you know. So um, anyway, uh, she, she goes on uh, that, that um, this hope of finding this, uh, um, of, of let's say you have a ecstatic experience. Now I'm thinking too, Charles, of, of your ISIS vision. She is um, saying that, that to, um, you can't say, I want to live in the ISIS vision. You need to bring the ISIS vision into the world like Gerda did, you know. And uh, um, uh, she, so, so just wanting to live into that other vision is a, a dangerous experience. And it belongs to the neurosis of the Pueri Turnus, who uh, generally, because he's so close to the unconscious, was always having overwhelming experiences of it, which convey to him a, a positive feeling of life, but he can't let them go and return to the earth. His strength is perfected when it returns to the earth. That's how Gerda cured his Pueri Turnus. They can't do it. It's too beautiful to stay in this bliss realm, you know, bring it back to the earth, stand on earth with your souls in rooted uh, gr ground, you know, then you've done something. Otherwise you are one of these tangential uh, people who live only provisionally. You spent your whole life in, a, in sort of having a, this hallucinogenic trip in the unconscious, you know, it needs to come back to the earth. Otherwise it's, you know, it's, um, it's, it's very dangerous, you know? And uh, uh, so the experience of the self never repeats. It only turns up at those desperate moments when one does not look for it anymore. Okay. The self only turns up when you're not looking for it anymore. It has turned, it, it, it turns completely in another direction and it stands before you in a different form in the one that you're not looking for, okay? It's, very, it's kind of chilling statement too. Uh, now, this is gonna be difficult to understand, but let's trust what she's saying. I mean, I, I know that some of you, but she's, She's speaking at a level that is way above us. Okay, let's just say that. She's, uh, it, you know, that it, the, the experience of the self does not repeat itself, but only turns up at those desperate moments when one doesn't look for it anymore because it always appears from a different direction and it stands before you in a different form because it is life. And it is the renewal of life itself. And it is the flow of life. And it can not, can not repeat itself. Because this is a contradiction of its very essence. That it is this constant renewal of the thing that has never been seen before on land or sea. And this is the water of life. The one that... Um, you know, what, what if you, um, see, if, if, you're, if you have an experience and you just hold on to it, it, it becomes uh, petrified. You know, it needs to melt and then some new, that it's never, not the water of life anymore because it, you, you perpetually need this systole, diastole, you know, this um, uh, embracing and then returning to the earth, to the ordinary world. You need to come back from the ordinary world. You can't live in that realm of bliss. And then you have to stay in the ordinary world until you're not looking for the self anymore. And then it will come back to you in a different form in a sense of renewal. Now, you don't have to buy that, but it's an it's a, it's a interesting thing to, uh, uh, to uh, hear, okay? Therefore, if, if ever one has an experience of the self, the only way afterward not to get poisoned and on the wrong track is to return to the earth. Bring it back to the earth. 
just like Goethe did. This is how Goethe cured himself. The more ego clings to it and in the beyond, uh, the more one chases it away with your ego desire. Because once you say, oh, I love this, I love this, I love this, you know, now your ego, you're not, no, you're no longer in this um, sort of Taoist state that is at the middle plane, halfway between uh, the inner world and the outer world. Now, ego is wanting like Gollum, who's a Gollum in the, in the uh, Hobbit that wants to possess the ring. You know, you become this like obsessed being, you know, that's not, that's not this magical uh, uh, one who goes up and down the hills of the world, careless and fearful of nothing with the lion roar of illumination, you know. That's uh, something, a frozen character. And this always comes up in uh, all the fairy tales where all these people are turned to stone, you know. You tur you're turned to stone because um, you've turned into Senex. Senex is when ego suddenly appropriates the uh, images of the unconscious and tries to, you know, uh, think it's, it's now, uh, puts this in our treasure house, you know. It's, that, now, that it's pretty subtle what we're saying here. So, so anyway, um, let's keep going here because there's some really cool things here. Uh, ooh, we're almost done. Well, let me, <laughs> I can't believe how that last 20 minutes has gone by. But I do want to say something about, um, let's see what we can finish here there with a bang. You know, um, the, uh, the hero is the wounded, um, uh, one who's always wounded in the heel. It's just interesting that, uh, you know, there's all these uh, figures. This is Falak Pease. You know, and he was wounded by standing on the uh, on the hidden grave of Hercules. He knew he was the only one that knew it where it was, and he wasn't supposed to reveal it. But one day he stood on it, and his heel was wounded. You know, and then of course there's um, this is the 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 wounded uh, uh, hero. Oh wait, I uh, is the um, is uh, then there is of course. Um, you know, uh, Achilles, you know, now how did Achilles become like that? That's a pretty mysterious image is uh, through, uh, I, I turned that off too quick, is uh, um, when they dipped him in this uh, water, which made him impervious, the nurse held him by the heel, you know, so there's this idea of the, uh, of the, of the hero has a weak point, you know? And uh, now she's gonna talk to, uh, and we'll come up with this next time, but is this image of the shaman uh, and, and the image of the, uh, the reluctant shaman. Nobody comes, uh, this one uh, great hunter who had a neurosis and the only time he could ever uh, get rid of it is to beat a shaman drum and do cures and call up ghosts, but he hated it. And so he wanted to uh, uh, return to hunting, but he got sick again. So then he had to come back. And uh, so, and, and the, the only one who can overcome suffering. And now the, the important thing about suffering here, and I'm just going to open it up for questions in just a couple minutes, is uh, that what, who is suffering? This is a, a wonderful uh, little part she uh, says. Um, she says, um, when the self and the ego get in touch with other, each other, who is wounded? When we're talking about the wounded healer, both are wounded. You know, as soon as they come together, uh, both are wounded because they are in touch with the other. Uh, the, there's a partial damage to the self, just as there's a partial damage to the ego. And the two cannot meet without damaging each other. So they both become wounded. And they both heal themselves by the other. The ego wounds the self. The self wants healing too. The, uh, it, it, see, the self, what happens to the self, it becomes, all the self is, 
and think about this. This is this is uh, not very happy state. It's only a potential wholeness. That's what the self is. It's only a potential wholeness. But when it tries to enter uh, and and not become only potential, be, become a real wholeness, then it becomes only a partial reality. So it has two choices. It can either be a potential wholeness that never occurs, or it can become a partial reality, but not really real, only partially real. So, and in the case of the ego, it's wounded because something much greater than it breaks into its life. We are not the masters in our own house. Now, every dream tells us this. Every fairy tale tells us this. We are not the masters in our own house. So uh, it's, it's, uh, um, that's how the, the ego gets wound, wounded. And the, the image of the reindeer hunter is a very good image. And so, and then she also mentions, um, uh, and we'll go over this a little more carefully next time. And then uh, we'll finish up lecture five and start lecture six. Uh, in uh, in the saying of Christ in the in the Acts of John and the Apocrypha, Christ stands in the middle of dancing apostles, and as they're dancing around him, he says, "It is your human suffering that I want to suffer." If um, if the self is not in touch with the human being, it's only potential wholeness. And so the divine figure has no suffering when it's potential wholeness. It longs to experience reality. The images long for the light, but it knows that that by doing that experiences human suffering. It is your human suffering I want to suffer, says Christ. Man would not suffer if he were not connected with something greater or he would suffer only as an animal does. And she mentions, and I'll finish with this, that when an animal suffers, it doesn't really, it just tries to get along, just tries to keep going. But when a human being suffers, uh, and, and she, she mentions this too, uh, a, uh, 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 she says, when, if you have ever had to deal with anyone who's met a horrible fate, now this is the difference between a human suffering and animal suffering. You will see what a terrific revolt can be seen in that person. And this is what they say, which no animal will ever say. I cannot accept it. I cannot. Why has this happened to me? I know it is irreversible, but I cannot accept it. The animal will never show that kind of suffering. It just carries on until it dies. But for us, uh, we, it, we, it's not so easy to kill us. And then this problem comes, what does this suffering mean? Why do I go on living with this suffering? And in such cases, the suffering becomes a religious problem. And one can say, therefore, that um, the, the whole idea of suffering is to find the meaning in it and to accept the meaning Without, re without resignation. And she mentions that in, in Christian suffering, there's too much resignation in it. And there's people who have a cramped faith, you know, uh, uh, where a, a real relation to suffering is absolute acceptance of it. No resignation, no hidden, um, uh, uh, I can't accept this. And then you find the meaning in it, you know, but. Uh, and then she'll, we'll talk more about the wounded healer, too, because it's just really fascinating, too. Well, why don't we just quickly, uh, what, Gary, why don't I just skip you, because you can say anything later. But why don't we just, I uh, always not leave enough time, just hear Tim. And uh, do you have any comments, Tim? I'm sorry. Well, I'm re really intrigued with um, with the this last little bit about the suffering is in in the Christian world, there's too much acceptance. Um, I've got to really chew on that because it seems to me that suffering is the avenue for growth. Well, yes, and, she, they said they're, they, ex, they, they think it's the way they, they, 
Christianity is all about suffering. But it, she says Christians do not accept the suffering gladly. They accept it with a certain amount of resignation and sorrow. You know? Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. And she says that doesn't help. She says, because now you're preaching the ego. Right. She says, you're preaching the ego. That's not acceptance. You need to tell ego, accept the suffering, accept the suffering. Well, I mean, you're just telling ego that. that de- you don't need to tell anybody it. You need to. She says, and which comes first, meaning and acceptance or acceptance and then meaning? She says, sometimes you say, okay. And, and you know what it really means is, is like my mother was really good at this. She had uh, pancreatic cancer. Just, I don't care. Let it go. You know, I'm not going to just going to accept every day and live in the moment, you know, and uh, at yeah, that, and that she became a goddess, really. I mean, she just became absolutely uh, a bodhisattva living in the world. She was full of love. You know, I mean, the unconscious was speaking to her. But go ahead, Tim. I'm sorry. Well, that I'm just saying that the, the suffering is where the light gets in. Yes. And. Western culture is just totally the opposite of that. <laughs> you know, we'll do anything to, to avoid suffering, even if it's just taking a pill for a headache rather than dive into it to see what kind of wisdom it has for us. Anyway, that was my yeah. thought. Well, and never forget, I mean, and, and Miles mentioned this, is that the, the poison of the suffering awakens the healing function within us that is going to heal the suffering. And the only way that we can heal it is to be in service to someone who has suffered a similar wound. What, Annette, do you have any comments or observations or doesn't have to be about this, I mean, anything? You don't? Okay. <laughs> or go ahead. Okay. How about you, Miles? Yeah, one thing that comes to mind, and I think I might have said it here before. Um, the indigenous people, at least uh, I'm thinking of a documentary by the National Film Board of Canada, which I need to go and find. It's, it's in the archive somewhere. Uh, it, I remember it so vividly. It was shown to me when I was in grade eight. So we're talking 50 years ago almost. And I was really surprised. It was this documentary of the Inuit people of Northern Canada, where they're moving uh, to capture, to hunt seals. They're living in igloos. And this was filmed probably in the 50s before these traditions were lost. And at one point, the old grandfather, he just smiles and says, to the family, I'm I'm done. And he just sits down in the snowbank and they sort of have, they set him up with some things, I guess, maybe some food. And and he's just smiling, but he's cashing in his chips and there's no big deal about it in a sense. I'm sure they were saddened, but they didn't look at death as anything to be fearful of. And that just so shook me as a kid. Um, it's still vivid in my memory. And, and another point I'd like to make is uh, we will, uh, Western people, anthropologists even maybe, may characterize things like a sacred place, like a, a mountain where it's the legend has it, oh, that's where they sacrificed old women. No, it. I'm saying I think it might just be that that old woman mountain was where an old woman just said, I'm going, you know, I'm going back to the earth sort of thing. So I just make that point. Um, And then when you said that the self will present itself once, um, I have around me, you know, if I turn my camera, I would show you about a dozen binders. I'm constantly making notes what people say and then indeed even today you know and i will cite some of this information that you've provided because yes to me this stuff is presenting itself once and i need to grab onto it and do something with it right and uh 
So very appreciative of that. And in particular, what you said about wounded healers was very, um, you know, I'll share with you in due time what that meant to me. And then uh, the sacred circles that you talked about that don't exist, but yes, they do exist. I've participated in them uh, with um, indigenous neighbors, participated in tea ceremonies, thunder pipe ceremony and sharing circles. And they're just as you described. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. My wife's father died of voluntary shutdown. I, the doctor asked me, what, what did he die of? And I said, I think a voluntary shutdown. Which, Arpane, do you have any, uh, any strength, experience, and hope? <laughs> uh, I, um, I learned uh, uh, a lot today, so it was interesting to know about the self that um, it uh, appears when uh, we don't look look for it and uh, about its appearing and disappearing function and about the self and eco relationship and also it was very interesting uh, to know about the wounded healer archetype that we can um, help others if we in, in, to be in the service of others if we are wounded and also that we should accept the suffering without resignation absolute uh, acceptance of suffering well i uh, hope yeah hopefully next time we'll polish up the suffering aspect and the wounded healer aspect and and also the self appearing and disappearing it's uh, very interesting uh, I, I don't think I, I, I just, I'm sorry, I ran out of time. Charles, do you have any comments? Um, yeah, this uh, discussion was particularly relevant um, to me because I've been, um, you know, I am just polarized back and forth between, I don't know why I'm, I always want to live in some sort of extreme, either live totally in the inner world or totally in the outer world and I can't make two meet. And um, yeah, the idea of just trying to, well, I don't know, I'm um, trying to take the idea of a tutelary uh, seriously and um, really try to um, incorporate the idea of the goddess Isis as my kind of patron goddess um, because, well, you know, I'm, it, it chose me. Uh, not the other way around. And I think um, if I lived uh, to where I actually, you know, took that idea seriously and lived by it, I think that would, you know, it would, it would. How do you bring her into the earth? Would be yeah, exactly. Bring her right. Into the right. Earth and make her a practical experience. That's, that's what we'll right, kind of try right. to go through next time a little better. Yeah, um, that's what I'd really like to try to do. Also, I know I've mentioned this before. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone's seen it, but the Little Prince Netflix adaptation is really good. Uh, so if you guys have any interest in watching it, it's, it's surprisingly good. So yeah, that's Great. all I got. Yeah. Well, hi, Jordy. Uh, I haven't seen you yet, but uh, what, what's, what do you think? You got any comments? Yes, several. The first and the most important one is to say a big thank you to Jean Claire for his annotations, which has made my life here uh, much more easy. One thing is to listen to you and at the same time reading to Jean Claire notes, which are quite professional. I mean, the timing, etc. So again, thank you very much, Jean Claire. Now, concerning the last point, I want to make three or four, say, passing comments. Suffering and resignation. There is a physical suffering, and there, there is cultural variations which can be considerable. Uh, in the Western world, we have the tradition now out of trend of stoicism. stoicism. Perhaps it was the last generation of, say, where stoicism was the ideal. Boy Scouts were originally sort of a stoic. Boy Scouts and similars. Uh, one comment which comes to mind is experience in Africa, 
We have troops in Africa with the French in Chad in the, in the middle of the turmoil and very little is published for good reason. Well, the way to cope with physical pain of natives there has very little to do with our trained special forces of legionnaires or, or paratroopers. Now, uh, dealing with, with pain can be trained. If any one of you has done at some point the silver mind control, it does work. But that's another story. Now, there is another suffering which is much more existential. I'm going to resignation. Resignation to one's fate, to one's destiny, makes sense. Is putting the ego in proper place. Now, the Christian, more specifically, how the variety of Christian churches has dealt with that, uh, well, they often cheat because the business of churches is salvation. And they have the monopoly. And they are ruthless with competitors. Again, uh, uh, business, is, business is business, and the business of salvation, uh, no joke here. And salvation, uh, I won't elaborate. Uh, Miles, you are here. We have discussed that in some other times. Yeah. Uh, back to what you said, say, 15, 20 minutes ago, half an hour, about uh, healing circles. We are already in a healing circle. Not a ritual one, not a ceremonial one. We are sort of the, the waiting room of the ceremonial circle. And if you dare, I, I won't encourage, but I won't dissuade you either to put some formality in, in our meetings, in our Sunday meetings. But I have the feeling, and we I am perfectly comfortable with. Now, uh, Healings, grossly, I'm talking about uh, wounded healers and, and so forth, which is something which is easy to get lost, particularly myself being a physician. Either you surrender the captaincy of your ship to a professional and do what in Freudian language is a transfer. Do you use the word transfer in English? In um. Spanish? Transferencia. Yeah, transferencia. Transference. Transference. Transference, yeah. Well, that's uh, not some balls of medical business. The medical sociology in the 50s, Talcott Parsons and company, when they began studying the physician patient relation, it was a transference of authority. And if you don't transfer, you don't heal. Now, if you play the game, and we are, of doing yourself healing, your peers are a must. And how you trust, how you adapt, how you incorporate, how empathy and the management of, of empathy, deep empathy and sympathy as well and compassion uh, has a role here. Now, uh, my point, techni te technicalities matter. But bottom line, we are already, as far as I can tell, and I speak for myself, and I guess from the rest of you, I had had some sort of dealings in the past, that we are in a healing circle of sorts. Besides being fellow travelers in the noble sense of the word. Otherwise, uh, the material is, li is like the wine, needs some aging. I mean, it has to be read a uh, couple of times, go to the video again, etc. Uh, that means quality. Yeah, it takes me like three or four readings to then suddenly I say, oh, now I understand that. Yeah. By the way, by the way uh, you don't hide that you enjoy your sale. Uh, considerably doing that, which also helps. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I am the slowest learner. I have to almost write out everything by hand, where I know it. Uh, my guess is the one who gets most from this seminar is yourself. 
Well, I don't know. I just, uh, that's, I learned, I did, that's the, I, why I'm doing it too, is, is to learn. I mean, it's, uh, you know, and, and plus I think, okay, the wounded, only way to heal the wound is to find someone who suffered a similar wound and, you know, be in service to them. I mean, you know, whatever. I mean, all of us, you know, that's kind of an interesting fact that one sober drunk needs another sober drunk, like a man lost at sea needs a lifeboat. I mean, there's this certain sense of, uh, uh, of that in, involved. If I, if I may, two things. To heal the wound, somehow you have to open the wound. Cut. Open. That's what she says. Yeah. Or, or something cryptic. Open yeah. the wound. The second point is that there is an element of mystery here. That you won't know exactly what's going on. And there is not much pain in learning what's going on if we are in the do it yourself, like people level it will be a distraction. I think you, you found here and too, uh, that von Franz is going into some of the great mysteries here that uh, are almost a little beyond us, but we'll uh, try. And I, I'm gonna try to come back miles to that idea of the, of the, the self uh, doesn't repeat itself in the same form again. That's what she's saying. It, it, and it comes when you don't look for it anymore. When you stop looking well, for it. I think, it. It, yeah. and yeah, to me, it's like, okay, we have to grab it when it's there. Yeah. And so, for example, in what I'm doing, it seems so often what I produce is actually, or what I put out there is actually what I just recently heard, even though I have all sorts of materials around me that I've been collecting. It's kind of uh, discouraging to have a whole act of imagination where two or three in a row where nothing happens. And then it, 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 when you get to the point where you almost are giving up hope, then suddenly, you know, you have this sudden drop. Uh, Carlos or Angel, do you have any? Oh, go ahead, Jordi. You have to lower the guard. I mean, yeah. these things appear in a sneaky way, yes. but they don't have that much energy. So if you have arm guards in the perimeter, being alertness, ego alertness, etc., you don't make room for them to appear. No. They have to catch you somewhat distracted. Mm -hmm. That's when I, I have it, when I'm least expecting it. It comes when I'm sitting there waiting for it, you know, to no. return. And she says that it'll never come. You can't sit there and wait for it, you know. And she's also going to tell us a little bit, Tim, about... Uh, about trying to repeat a great artwork, you know, one that you really were in touch with the inner world when you did and how it's not just art, but uh, poetry, you know, too. Uh, Carlos or Angel, do you have anything? And I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Gary then. Okay, well, yeah, okay, all right. Okay, go ahead and Angel, if you have anything, just chime in. But I'm turning over to Gary now and it's all, well, actually, Craig, I guess I have a couple of questions for you on this, too. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You'll have to unmute. No. So that last drawing, you know, uh, von Franz said that it had feeling, but there was no emotion because, you know, no. there was no, no color in it. And, you know, so I guess, I guess I always thought of, you know, feelings are are a a refined emotion, an emotion that you know that you've you've given value to. And so, you know, I see this, and I'm you know I'm a little confused because I'm wondering, well, you know, how can you how can you separate the two? You know, because I thought in feeling there was always an underlying emotion, but you know that's not what she's saying. And she talks about the um, the sterileness uh, that follows uh, a great vision, you know, that there's a certain amount of sterility, it's particularly in a in a um, a, a very uh, a wonder 
child who's a wonderful artist when he's a child and then suddenly you go see when he's grown up and all the creativity's drown, dried up you know there's somehow it was only expressed when he was still naive when he became an adult he killed it you know so oh, because he, he lost the naivety yeah and and so well i guess that brings up a, another question though you know because you know here we are we're trying to you know we're trying to um you know, grow, grow close to the self, to merge with the self, to individuate. And yet, if, if we have an experience of the self, the, you know, it's like apparent, you know, trying to repeat that will result in failure. And yet, and yet we know that like, you know, like certain practices, like the, like the act of imagination, every now and then, you know, certainly not all the time, you will have those experiences um and so you know somehow there's this difference between you know we have a ritual we do it maybe we do it without expectation and then like i think the you know the example that was given where um you know the christians uh, and actually it's right here christ suffered on the cross i must accept this suffering which is preached to them that does not help at all because the person's merely preaching to his own consciousness and since it's not an experience it does not help so uh, you know i guess it almost seems that whatever practice we have it has to have a yearning that goes with it because otherwise there's no chance of an experience would you say that's longing. true yeah, yeah yeah there's has yeah. to be a longing but it's it's it's, it's some way we have to train our mind not to have ego desire, too. The de ego desire, the greediness of the ego, is, mm -hmm. can't be involved in the longing. And, and she mentions that wonderful example that, you know, you had a, this magical evening with someone on a, on a cruise ship at, uh, when the moon came out. You were going past uh, some Caribbean islands and the... You know, the reggae music was playing on the thing. And you say, oh, I want to recreate that experience. And she says, no, you can't do it. You know, I mean, it, it's one of these these wonderful things of, of and you know what I was thinking of? There are some artists who will not let themselves be recorded. Mm -hmm. They do. If, it, if, if you don't hear it live, you're not going to hear it. You know, and that's because they recognize this aspect. I was, you know, I was going to say, actually, you know, this is such an interesting topic because I think it pertains to all of us that, you know, if we miss our exercise, if other people want to chime in with other things, you know, let's just go ahead and, and do it. Um, but, okay, on what you just said, you know, so if we're, if we're in a relationship and we have you know, if, if you fall in love, in love seems to be the problem, you know, because that then you're you're an addict in an addiction, you're in a neediness because, there, you know, there's an element of yourself which is dependent on the other person. And, you know, this almost this almost strikes me as that, you know, it kind of correlates with, uh, you know, the experiences that that we seek with the self because if you let's say you feel love for another person you know then it's you know if if you're with that person you know it's it's good you know uh, you know you have you know you, you can create the third you can have that shared experience but there's no dependency on it. I think maybe it's the, maybe it's the dependency, maybe it's the addiction, maybe it's the neediness that prevents the, you know, the union with the, you know, the, the repeat of, of the experiences. I mean, what, what would you think on that? I think it's when ego consciousness leaves time and space, you know, and you experience some like epiphany type aspect that, does not happen easily. And it certainly doesn't happen with ego. There are certain moments when ego leaves time and space. Now, 
I don't know if you've ever heard of Keith Jarrett, you know, the uh, jazz piano player. He, he, that's what he tries to do in every uh, performance. You watch him sometimes. I mean, he spends more, almost as much time meditating before he plays than he plays. And he's playing almost pure uh, improvisation when he does it. But it's this idea of that, how do I get my center of awareness out of time and space? This is what James Joyce says about art. You know, art is something that moves us out of time and space. And if, if, it, if it just awakens the desire, he has a, he says most art is either propaganda or, and he doesn't mean this in the bad sense of the word, a, a, a pornography, something that just is to awaken. Well, you know, say Norman Rockwell's paintings mm. are somewhat what you would call something that's just to awaken sentiment or, or some kind of, emotion within us. Where, yes, can I? Yes, oh. go ahead, Annette. You're the artist expert. Go ahead. <laughs> there are many, many artists in the group, I'm yes. pretty sure. Okay. Um, but I'm just, what I've, what I've learned is that uh, we tend to uh, express in art in our non-dominant places. So that's why I think it is, it's, it's, it's like an act of imagination. It's immediately available. The moment you go into these, you know, whether it's music or, or or writing or painting, you are immediately with your in your non-dominant place. I think, and um, does it feel for others too? Does it does does it feel the same? Do you think that's the magic of haiku? The very image of a haiku is meant yes. to not exist in time and space. I mean, there's yes. this aspect, and they seem to just perfected that point that exists mm -hmm. at the at the center you know so almost all of very good haiku is uh, is transporting mm -hmm. yeah. so that yeah. how do we do that in our active imaginations how do we do that in our uh, anything we do yeah. well uh, Gary again you're uh, yeah well this you is going to be your I'm, time I'm well, no, I'm uh, I'm really enjoying this conversation. You know, and again, anyone that wants to chime in, just you know, have at it. Did you have well, some thoughts? Yeah, I'll just say that when I recently really paused to look up a word we all use so very much, but perhaps don't totally understand it or appreciate it, and that's the word individual. Uh, pardon me, education. Educe means to draw out what is latent in us and and so um we we're using that word as we talked previously very very casually and without the numinosity that it deserves because um you know what we're doing and what craig is doing is he's leading us every sunday on education educing what is latent in each of us in our own context and I'm, my context is I'm looking out the window at snow. It's snowing right now. You know, that's a context very different from Jordy. And we, we have to integrate this education in our contexts, but we can. You know, it's an amazing circle that Craig creates every Sunday for us. And, you know, it's helping me, for example, because I, the more I've been able to unload this story of the old grandfather Inuit man who just felt, oh, okay, I'm going to just sit down and die in the snowbank and you guys see you later. Uh, that really uh, has been a source of dissonance in me for the longest time. But coming into this circle and I can share that and I, and I can now, um, you know, as I have been thinking, we're sorting ourselves out here, you know, and that's the capital S. So it's very beneficial. Most of our words developed before we had this thinking function, IQ oriented uh, uh, civilization we lived in. 
like the word aletheia, which uh, the word truth comes from aletheia, and it means the absence of forgetting. It means the absence of forgetting where we came from, you know, in other words, who we're in service to, you know, which is this thing that Annette was talking about, this uh, you know, kind of- That's a really, a, you know, it's such, that's such a, a beautiful thing. Um, so the absence of forgetting, I, I wonder if that would also, you know, apply, if that would be, I'm always trying to, to get a feel and understanding, you know, uh, the emotional experience of being grounded and I almost wonder if that, you know, that almost expresses, it's not haiku, but, it, you know, but it's that, you know, that almost says something which can't quite be said in words, you know. Being grounded is the absence of forgetting. I need Annette to chip in on this and see what she thinks on that. Did you, did you um, mention, you said, you mentioned me there, did you? I did, I did, because, you know, I think the, you know, the work that you do with your clients, you know, you're, you know, my guess is, is there's a lot of it that you're trying to, you know, enable them to get grounded, to get out of the, you know, the, the head and yeah. into the earth. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and all I can say is, is what I've witnessed is that, yeah, what we were talking about today is that, yeah, an illness gets you there immediately, and mm. also, uh, um, yeah, suffering. But also, uh, what what is so vital, I think, is 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 to express it, to to not to have it stored in yourself, but to just to bring it out. And and I, all I am is a witness of that. That's all. And 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 people just express it. And they, and when I said about these non-dominant places, that's for everybody. I, I, I see, for me, in, in my experience, I see everybody going into that, you know? And it's it's just the willingness to go there and people do, and it is a, it's the time to connect and perhaps to be witness might be very important that in, in the beginning, it's so strange and so unfamiliar that having somebody's, beside you who witnesses you and might be vital for some you know and I think this group in in, in a way is a witness <laughs> yeah that was just beautiful you know I guess that you know one of the things that that it reminds me I, I read this book on shame and you know what they said in the book was that the most important thing in dealing with shame was to was to find you know, a really good friend and, you know, someone that you can be emotional with and that, you know, is, and will be very accepting and not judgmental. And then to, you know, go through exactly the experience, you know, and within as much, you know, with as much feeling as, as you can, what happened and how it affected you. And, you know, and, and then, you know, if they, you know, then have them accept you, you know, still afterwards, you know, because, you know, we're, we're human. And that is, you know, that was found to be like the, the most effective way to, you know, to not have it be something that then becomes a complex, you know, and has a history associated with it and we just, you know, carry it forward. So, yeah, I think, so, you know, and, and in meditation as well, you know, there's, you know, especially Buddhist meditation, you know, there's the whole concept of, of, of being a witness, you know, to ourselves and, you know, being able to feel separate. Um, and I guess, and I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe someone here, maybe Jordy, you know, has, has, you know, has a lot more experience with this, but, um, you know, I always, I, I don't know, I have some problems with the Buddhist philosophy because, you know, I feel like, you know, their idea of therapy is, is, you know, kind of tends towards repression, you know, really, it's like, you know, this is simply not a part of me. And, I, you know, I've always felt that no, you're going to, you know, you're, you're going to have to go down, you know, and down and through before you can begin the journey up. What, what are your thoughts on that, Georgie? 
Again, what's my? Yeah. What's my what? Your thoughts on, on like, you know, how, because I, I know you go to all these meditation retreats and I don't know if any of that's a, you know, a, a Buddhist approach or not, but, you know, but I struggle with the Buddhist approach for, you know, trauma. Because, you know, you know, mostly it seems like what they do for trauma is to, you know, like, like they may might witness it, but, you know, but they won't do, they won't do the, you know, the depth psychology of like, okay, let's go in and, and really relive this and experience it and try to reframe it. My experience here. Uh, and then maybe you don't have experience with that. I just, you know, I thought hmm, maybe Jordy has thoughts on this. I, I, spent, I spent about three hours and a half this morning on meditation. At the end of the day is detachment. It's putting distance. And particularly at the end when we do what it's called, say, loving kidness, meta bhavana, huh? that is embrace your enemies or the people who are pain in the ass grossly. Uh, my Jungian interpretation is to push your ego aside. Don't judge. Connect with the living, uh, vibrating part of, of, of living beings. Mm. Now, this happens to be wonderful for pain management. Not acceptance. I mean, uh, not equanimity. Uh, say, uh, as mental or intellectual notion as living with that there is something and you participate in this something that's beyond the traumatized piece of body and that in my experience has a direct healing effect hmm. the so, neti neti i know my breath i am not my breath I, you know, it's yeah. that mula, uh, when you go to the uh, purgation, the detachment, I, I know my anger, I am not my anger, you know, I mean, the neti neti, this detached aspect, but it, in, the, in, uh, in uh, Europe, Jung said we could never go past the heart chakra, you know, uh, because we can't leave the earth, and after you leave the heart, you leave the earth. I just mentioned real quick uh, that um, cranial sacral therapy I did when when she touched my soles of my feet. That was one of the the most magical experiences I've ever had in a in a cranial. I mean, in a meditation, is that that suddenly there's this uh, connection of this is your God, the soles of your feet that are connected with the earth. Yep. I have a question about the um, the circular chart that you have that represents the great mother in the center with the variations of mm -hmm. of types of women. Is there a chart similarly from the male? Craig? Yeah, there is uh, something not quite like that, but but it, it is in uh, the book "The History of Human Consciousness" by uh, by Neumann. That's where he discusses the male archetype. But you know, it I has just, been. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I'd just be curious to you know if you got this chart and you had you know, a big council, council of women come together, uh, would they, what would they create and with that chart and would they sort themselves out? And, you know, um, maybe that's what this world needs is, is women to take that chart and um, find among themselves uh, who they would esteem to be in the middle and put themselves around. I, I just, I just think it'd be an interesting social experiment. Well, you, you know, but uh, uh, Emma Young, I've told this before, where she has uh, Faust, uh, you know, kind of goes through the chart, you know, when he's trying to translate the book of John, the gospel of John, 
and he doesn't know how to start it. And he says, in the beginning was what? He says, in the beginning was the power. Well, that was the, um, the one who can provide the seed, okay? And we're talking about the male, the masculine quartet. And then in the second one was, in the beginning was the deed. Now, this is that mysterious man from across the sea who sweeps us off our feet and takes us into uh, the world of great adventure, timeless adventure. Then it was in the beginning was the word. Okay, now this is the, the scholarly prosaic uh, uh, logos or inner world of, of John. And then the last one was in the beginning was the meaning. You know, this is the wise old man. So there's those four, the, the one who provides the cow and the seed, that's the power. The deed is this dark man, Rudolph Valentino, who sweeps us out of our ordinary realm of existence and just brings us to, into this ecstatic world. And then there is the uh, uh, Narcissus of Narcissus and Goldman, that, that book by Herman Hesse. And then the final one is, is the uh, green man, you know, the one uh, Merlin. You know. Well, anyway... Now, I was just going to mention that this last half hour, Gary, that's your hour, a half hour, and uh, hopefully uh, you, you'll you ju just do what you can to help the group out. You do anything you want. So this, cool. this is what you chose to do today, right? Yeah, yeah. So exactly. Jordi, go ahead. I have to run up because I have a Zoom meeting in half an hour. Okay. Uh, now, I would like to know more about your cranial sacral introduction oh yes i i will tell uh i'll write a little bit about it in an email but i can discuss it next time uh yeah uh, because it was not not massage and it was i'm gonna have another one thursday and then i'm so i'm gonna have two sessions before my next analysis so i will tell you uh particular i'll have a my second session and then i can maybe speak a little better because my body was just frozen i thought but then i found out my head it was my head that was frozen, not my body. But anyway, uh, yes, I will do that next time. And I, I, I think uh, 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 we're done then, aren't we, Gary? Or right No, now? I have to, I'm giving a homework assignment for next oh, time. Okay, I think maybe we'll, do, maybe we'll do a discussion again like this. But I guess what I'd like everyone to bring is any practices that you have that you feel bring you closer to the center you know, or, or make you more grounded, either one, you know, so, and then we can, and then, you know, we'll just kind of share. Yeah. Jo Jordy, did you have that, want to have the last word then, or what did you want to say? Yes. Uh, uh, responding to Miles on the female versus male individuation and the yes. roles of gender, that could be the basis of a five session seminar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I mean, it is, uh, let, me, let me mention two that, that lo we, we're, we live in a Logos world and we need Eros, but we need both. And there needs to be a tension between them. You can't, Eros without Logos, don't ask for it. Don't wish for you what it, because you might get it. You need Logos and yeah. Eros both, or you're going to have either a sappy mess or a completely sterile world. One of the two. Let's put that way. According to Neumann, yeah. the, the thing from Neumann, Males are protected from the magnetism of the great mother. Females are not. Yes. Yeah. Which is well, corrosive. We are protected from that. And that should be a starting point. As the bearer of life. Yeah. It's a, it's a great uh, mystery. It really is. This is a, a just mind blowing uh, yeah. field we're in here. So, uh, anyway, uh, thank you, everybody. Oh, and Gary's. Um, assignment is to come with something what what Gary? Well, come come with what your practice is you know whether it's meditation or whatever for getting closer to the self or a grounding exercise for for example that'll be so fun i'd like i'd love to hear everybody's uh, yeah i would too on that okay well thank you everybody and we'll see you next time okay bye thank you gary bye. and everybody sure. miles and everyone bye now. Net.